I'm John Kachoyan, the literary manager of Australian Plays, and we're here today with Wesley Enoch, the director of the Sydney Festival. Hi, Wesley. Hi, John. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks for coming in. No worries. Thanks for having us. Um, so talk to us about Sydney Festival 2019. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. This is my third festival, and so I've been looking at what are the big stories that I want to tell. Like, I don't necessarily go out looking for themes. Mm -hmm. I, I listen to artists and what artists are doing and why they want to do it and what we want to do about the world and I don't try to intervene in that way too much but what I've found is the most important stories always come out with uh, artists always get attracted to the most dramatic and the big stories and so for me there's this thing around um, the the seeking of safety you know the idea of um, be it through migration or be it safety in the home or safety in the workplace, this notion of how we uh, need safe places to have ambitious voices, that it's not until you feel safe that you can then express your cultural differences or your uh, cultural ambitions in certain ways. So, you know, from the waves of migration, like, like uh, counting and cracking where you go, mm. Here's a story about four generations of Sri Lankan, of a Sri Lankan family from the, the civil uh, war in Sri Lanka through to migration and being in, in Australia now. And there's a sense that it's, I remember talking to Shakti about this and, and he says, yes, it's a Sri Lankan story about a Sri Lankan family, but it's in fact an incredibly Australian mm. story. This is the story that the majority of Australians have experienced either in one or two generations ago, or maybe even going back to five or six generations ago, but the experience of coming to this country, looking for safety, looking for security, coming here, um, is something that we all share, and it's something that's in our DNA as a country. Of course, we've got our you know, First Nations kind of conversation as well, but this notion of the bulk of Australians, what is it, about 42%, I think, of all Australians were either born overseas or have a parent born overseas. And this notion of the migrant experience is deeply in our cultural DNA. But why do we not tell more stories about it? What is that yeah. about? Is this sense of going, you know, the, the young migrant kid, you know, we talked about your father before, the young migrant kid who has the lunchbox full of, you know, what we would think now is delicacies <laughs> yeah. and extraordinary beautiful foods is, is taught to feel shame about that um, as a young kid or, or could be, not mm. always, I guess. And so this idea now of, uh, uh, sorry, finishing that, that they, they then go, well, how do we succumb to the story of the status quo, of the majority, etc.? cetera? Uh, and now we're going, no, actually, we are all part of uh, an intersectional kind of community of sexualities and uh, uh, genders and cultural backgrounds and demographics. And, and the more we accept our differences, the stronger a community we are. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the Sydney Festival is about telling some of those stories. Um, the other big kind of theme is the First Nations stories, as I, as I was saying, and that even now, you know, when we think, you know, 230 years ago or thereabouts, when we're getting the the first fleet arriving this notion even now we have to talk about the first nation story as if in an educative kind of fashion yeah it was weird it's weird that we still are in that kind of world and this show that we're talking about um uh, man with the iron neck where we're saying yes there's there's ideas of uh, suicide but also ideas of uh, indigenous resilience that we have to talk about um, a man with the Iron Neck, written by fantastic Ursula Jovic, uh, with legs on the wall. So it's a it's a text-based piece, but also a very physical-based piece, and looking at a family dealing with um, the aftermath of actually intergenerational suicide, a father who's passed away, and then uh, his son kind of taking his own life, and what's left behind, what's the family that's left behind, and the the story gets its name from. A circus act, uh, a man with the eye neck, meaning that he could hang from his neck and his muscles so strong that he would not choke, he would not die. And going, yes, this idea of death and suicide, but also this idea of resilience. Mm. And it's a powerful story. And then all through the festival, we've come back with this idea of what is our resilience? What is our restatement of purpose? What's our, our um, acknowledgement of survival as a First Nations uh, peoples in this landscape 
and how we are also looking through for our own forms of of cultural safety within this mm. kind of greater world and i think that goes hand in hand with the ideas of resilience the more people have stories to tell the more they have the handles on which to deal with complex cultural political social issues the better we are uh, it's interesting i i was looking at a piece of research around brexit and they were saying that it was interesting to watch that the the electorates that had fewer migrants in it voted to leave the European Union. This idea that they had very little uh, face to face experience, actual yeah. experience of side by side with with uh, uh, migrants to use that term um, in their communities and they were scared and wanted to leave. But those who had more migrants in their communities you know, through migration or through work placements, et cetera, et cetera, overwhelmingly voted to stay. Mm. And one of the arguments put forward was this notion of, well, once you have a face-to-face -face experience, a work experience, a romantic experience, a, 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 a different kind of family experience, that you all your fears dissipate. If you understand the stories of others, that your fears dissipate because of that. Mm. And the festival does a lot of that stuff, especially in, in the uh, um, First Nations world, but also the migrant stories or the experience of being Australian here. The other big kind of thematic that I've come through is the idea of uh, uh, the anniversary of the moon landing, which is a kind of big thing that we're talking about 50 years ago mm. next year, uh, 2019, that there's a idea of collective cultural ambition that mm. was expressed through the moon landing. Something momentous. Yeah, yeah. And, and that most people who are old enough remember what they were doing on the day and think about it. But also for us to remember a little bit of history that when you come out of World War II and the migration that happened into, in this case, Australia, from Greeks, Italians, uh, uh, well, Eastern and Western European migration into Australia, um, through even through the Middle East and uh, well, well, everywhere basically, mm. all those who were touched by war, by the time you get into the 40s and the 50s, they're coming to Australia in great numbers. And that the whole space race, the whole idea of um, looking to the stars, looking to the moon and, and having an ambition to get there, unified us all, mm. especially Western countries. Well, also, I guess, Russia and yeah. uh, to a lesser degree, China. But there were, a, there were these kind of cultural things that pulled us together and gave us a, a strong focus. Mm. And for that 20, 30 years, there was very limited ideas of war. You know, uh, mm. we get Vietnam eventually and we get Korea in there as well. But this notion of we were, we were focused on uh, achieving an ambition to get to the moon. It's really interesting too because that out of that time comes things like the NHS and maybe, you know, those kind of ideas of yep. collective responsibility and social justice and and things that maybe the world is um, some parts of the world are losing sight of or losing Civil rights movements. Of. The, the referendum in 1967 that gave Aboriginal people full rights as citizens there was a huge social change mm. that came off the back of war. Yeah. And this idea of remembering our history and, and looking at the patterns of history so that we can learn from it. I mean, it's, it's the great um, joy of getting older that you see patterns forming. Um, Are they reassuring? Oh, they're both reassuring. You can, you can get either jaded or you can get hopeful. You know, you have a choice to make. And I have day on, day off, maybe, <laughs> about <laughs> things like that. But as a, as a kind of someone working in the arts and someone talking about storytelling, you start to realize that, yeah, we, we do have, there are ebbs and flows, there are ways of doing things. And being in charge of Sydney Festival is very important because, you know, you can talk about those stories in, in different ways and reflect what the true Australian experience is. Um, going back to this idea of the moon landing, that it's the kind of, that's the same kind of thinking we need around um, collective action, mm. around uh, climate change, the environmental movement, that in fact, individuals won't change the world, groups of individuals will. And how we uh, group ourselves together, how we manage our, our society together, how we get engaged in our political and social processes is very important. Because I think many of the, um, Many of the powers that be, the one percenters, the political masters, all that kind of language, the, 
they are only there because we let them be there. Mm. And if we start to say, we don't want that, Tony Abbott, we don't want you to, to scuttle climate change uh, action or things like, we, we, want to, we want you to represent us. The more we can say that, the more we can create social change. And so for me, telling those stories is really important. Mm. Getting out there and making sure that the stories are being told is one of those things I go, I just, I just don't think we should sit back and throw our hands up, get jaded and say, oh, well, that's somebody else's job. It's always our job to do. And running a festival is a bit like that as well. And so in terms of your kind of year, when, when, do, you, when do these strands start to appear? Are they, are they self-evident? Is it something that you only maybe realise subconsciously later that this theme or this sort of yeah. co this concern has arisen? Well, behind you on a wall is all these <laughs> cards. Fascinating wall. Yeah, yeah. And people look at it and go, oh, are you going to do that? And you go, oh, no, we may not do that. But that's, it all starts to form. I'm a very analog person in terms mm -hmm. of the way um, ideas come. So you talk to me, I write up a card, I put it on the wall, and it starts to shape. And, and admittedly, some things then just fall off or some things get isolated or aren't possible. And they say you, get, you only get to program about one in a hundred things. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, a hundred things come across my desk. I maybe for whatever reason only get to program one of them. And so you're just trying to keep exposing yourself all the time, building new relationships. Um, I'm very keen on the idea of new commissions, especially in Australia where we've had a, well, let's say the last five years have been tumultuous. Mm. We've seen cuts to the Australia Council in particular. We've seen lots of strings attached to monies. And so there's been um, a problematic development in the small to medium sector in particular, the protection of the large organizations, of which Sydney Festival is one of them. And so like I've been articulating a responsibility that as a, a large organization that is, well, well quasi protected, that it's our job to make sure we do talk to the small to medium sector. We do look at new works and commissioning things um, and, and we're kind of building up over time. And that the Australian voice, if, if you go back and you think about the 1960s and 70s, this whole era of self-determination and hearing our stories and things, that gave way in the 80s and 90s to an almost economic rationalist positioning, mm. that we believe that we are an industry, not a community, that uh, our job is to, uh, to, to to look at economic benefits and economic multipliers of what the work that we're doing. And I think, you know, I don't want to poo poo poo, that's there somewhere. But I think in the 21st century, we will go back to it's about expressing our identity, you know, in a content uh, environment, mm -hmm. a content generation environment. You know, we were talking before, we're all writers, everyone's a writer, everyone's generating content because it's a way of expressing our lives, our stories our community experiences and to see ourselves in the lunchbox, to go back to that metaphor, in the lunchbox out in the playground, that's something that's unique and distinctive. And if we don't see our stories told, often we move to more destructive means to, to get out there. So um, this, this, uh, all forms of terrorism are a form of uh, asserting yourself on the public storytelling mm. of that nation, city, state. Uh, and the theatrical acts, yeah, know, in a horrible way, a yeah. terrible way that that they are done for the most dramatic and theatrical, to use that term, way to get out there. And it, now we can snap things on on our iPhones, or we're constantly uh, surrounded by the the means of production. There are constructive ways of building our communities, and there are de destructive ways of doing it. And don't we want to be more constructive? Don't we want to see that? individuals have, you know, it's a very Marxist position, you know, the means of production, this idea of c creating content that um, speaks to us as a nation, if not a, a world population. Mm. So in many ways, you know, the whole, the hoary old thing around, you know, global, local, you know, all that stuff, think globally, act locally. But there is a point where that's the way it works nowadays too, that, you know, today you could be, um, fiddling around with a podcast in your back backyard, in your back shed, about something that is really important to you. And then it can go out there and reach the whole globe because that's the way that, that that's what's out there. And so for us in Australia, 
we it's not a battle against external forces and external stories it's just not to abdicate responsibility to tell our own stories in that environment as mm. well in, in terms of the sydney festival the, for festivals in general what is the difference for you between programming you know say a theater company over a year and programming something that's sort of an intense burst what mm. what does it give you and what, what does it take away? Well, it's such an accelerator. I mean, I think a festival is where, where in, in a, a theatre company, let's say you have a subscription of, what, eight or ten shows, depending on the company, that's over a whole year. It feels like a bread and butter, meat and three veg kind of experience. You go as a regular way of engaging culturally with what you're doing and the, the debate and discussion happens really naturally mm. over time. In a festival m model, it's a hothouse. It's an accelerator. Your cultural accelerator. You just you go. You can see ten shows in two weeks, mm. and suddenly you you're finding the parameters of the theatrical discussion really quickly. You can go. I can see this show, like the chat, yeah. you know, which is extraordinary about um, uh, ex-convicts. To use that term, there's the, the people who are talking about regret and remorse and rehabilitation and, and connection to community and, and things. You can go from there all the way through to Counting and Cracking or Ghost in My Suitcase, you know, a, a fantastic story based on a book of the same name about, you know, a, a young girl going to China, meeting a grandmother and becoming a ghost hunter, a ghost fighter. This, this, you start to feel the parameters of the storytelling, the different forms, the different stories that are possible. And, and for me, that, that's, that says something more about diversity, about stuff. Like, I've got this great theory, too, that, that um, often with festivals, and this is a criticism, there'll be a kind of ticker box kind of mm. philosophy. You go, I've got my Aboriginal show. It's done. You know, I've got Man with the Iron Neck. Done. Perfect. Aboriginal tick. Done. Moving on. You know, and the, you, know, you, you can see that with any kind of uh, grouping you want. You know, here's my gay show, done, yeah. pick, tick, lovely, moving on, or whatever. But for me, there's a sense of trying to get depth. So you get man with the iron neck, but you also get the weekend. Mm. You know, Henrietta Baird's work, which is a stunning one person show about her, her racing around Redfern and Waterloo, trying to find where her partner is and kind of make sure her kids have food and, you know, the kind of um, the frustration of a, of a working artist out on tour coming back. And, and for me, you go, oh, well, here's two different stories. And then you get Billa Durang or you get the Always Sculpture. You get all mm. these different things so that you can kind of work out a depth of experience, a depth of storytelling. Um, and, you know, yes, we have the international shows and music and, and great cabaret and all that stuff. But for me, I want to make sure that because of that accelerator process, that people can go deep into stories and can see things connected. So uh, Counting and Cracking that we talked about, there's also a, a piece from Canada called Old Stock, which is looking at the Jewish migration into Canada for uh, early 20th century migration and looking at the Jewish migration as a, a prototype, if you like, to think about what does it mean for Sudanese or Middle Eastern migration in the 21st century that maybe it will take us 20, 30 years to feel the full effects of having different cultural values in our society. Mm. And so, you know, you can see different shows connected up together in a program like like a festival rather than a theatre company that you just, you feel this kind of languid movement through the whole year and you you, you don't get the, the sense of the rapid jigsaw mm. puzzle being put together. And in the, the kind of synchronous way. conversations and... Absolutely, yeah. and the debates you can have. And you go, what I love is, uh, and I'll, I'll, I often misquoted, but. I love when people hate things. <laughs> you know, they can go, I hated that show. And I go, fantastic, tell me why. <laughs> and they'll tell you, tell you, tell you. And then, you know, so the same person comes back and says, I love this show. And you go, that's just as useless. Tell me why <laughs> you loved it, because that's what it's about. Mm. It's not just about you experiencing the show. That's great. It's lovely. You've bought a ticket. You've been there. Fantastic. It's actually the cultural conversations you can have afterwards with your friends, your family, your workmates, you know, the, the stranger in the bar where you can actually talk about things because in, in, in this kind of day and age where we have a algorithmic kind of tribalism that forms through social media and things, we're, we're not often talking to people who disagree with us. Yeah. 
and the arts are such a soft way to disagree. You know, what you love, I hate. What, you know, people with curly hair love straight hair. Blah, blah. It doesn't, these things don't matter. Mm. The debate is what matters. The discussion is what matters. You know, change the date of Australia Day. Don't change the date of Australia Day. The discussion is really, really the thing that will keep us going. Mm. You know, and then we'll make a decision and, you know, people will, might feel one way or the other. The same-sex marriage debate was similar. You go, the debate can be very positive. Yeah. And we risk a kind of flattening of debate in public life. Agreed. When, Agreed. It, when it balances either just as, you know, I present one side and now here's the opposite side almost for its arbitrariness. Yeah. Your sense of the city itself. I, I grew up in Sydney, but I haven't lived here for a while. But, uh, you know, obviously you're from, you know, you travel a lot and you've encountered a lot of cities. How has your experience of Sydney itself changed over the festivals? And, and where, where do you think the city is at the moment? Yeah. It, the, oh, I navigated through so much building work. On yeah, the way, on the way down. <laughs> it's interesting that mm, the foundations of the city of Sydney are based on a couple of things. Um, incredible trauma. Mm. You know, within two or three years of coming here, the smallpox epidemic wiped out about two thirds of the, well, mostly Aboriginal population. I'm sure others died as well. Um, the idea of the, you know, within the first three days of the first fleet landing here, it was all orgies, sex, rape, rum. And so we have this, and, and then the other foundation narratives about the military presence and the control. Mm. And all of these things keep playing themselves out. You have a kind of hedonistic city life that gets the lockout laws with the almost kind of military style yeah. stopping it from happening. Uh, you have an ongoing sense of trauma that the city plays out over and over again in sometimes violent ways where the, the city is, is catatonic with inaction. And you think about some of the building projects at the moment in the George Street and, and even Barangaroo where the city just grinds to a halt and stops things from happening because it's, there's something about the decision making here which uh, it's almost like you need a, a force of nature, a big persuasive, forceful personality to break through things. And so premiers, lord mayors, uh, business people, have a kind of crash or crash through kind of mentality in the way decision making happens here. And so sometimes very thoughtful um, debate is almost impossible to do. I mean, one of the things um, I, I was talking about the light rail and going, what Sydney had the opportunity to do was, was bypass the whole 20th century technology of the light rail and jump into you know, self-driving vehicles or self-navigating mm. kind of electric buses or all that stuff or create busways. All of this technology and thinking was around, but because it took 15 years to argue for it, the, the city had to have a light rail. Mm. And so you, you end up going, oh, where's the thoughtfulness about the future and things? And the city has really benefited from a kind of bang, crash through the opera house, bang, make it happen. You know, the, the, the business mentality, which just goes, let's bang, like make it happen. And the kind of political leadership that has come from Sydney has been incredibly forceful. Good, bad, mm. no real value judgment there. It's just, that's the way it is. Uh, and so for me, there's a, a really interesting cultural conversation to have about how do you stimulate conversation and debate? How do you invite people that maybe feel disempowered in that debate to come and be part of it and to feel celebrated and that it's not an insult to start a conversation and a debate that's not an insult it's not mm. I, i'm not against you because i have an opinion that isn't your opinion do you think that's a particularly australian thing i suppose i often feel with my european friends that there's kind of a, more of a social contract that we will talk about big things yeah. and that they're not off the table. And you know, whenever we hit, we're close to Christmas at the moment and I always think of how little political, you know, there's all the things you don't talk about at a sort of Anglo-Australian <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> Everything just is, un, you know, don't talk about any of those things and actually kind of feeling like coming out of the Australia we're in at the moment going, actually I want to and, and maybe yeah. theatre provides a 
a space for that. In a very soft way as well. I mean, if we think about the kind of great egalitarian dream of Australia, which was we won't have lords and ladies and... Mm. Uh, no class. No class. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and that's kind of evolving in different ways now. But also we've done away with the idea of experts. The idea of... Well, knowledge is suspicious in Australia. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. And I, I really want there to be elite artists in the way that we, we absolutely talk about elite sports people mm. or elite business people or um, I want the elite librarian. Mm. I want the elite theatre maker, the elite musician. I, I love the idea of the elite visual artist. Someone who you go, wow, they're amazing. Yeah. And that it's beyond just the objective sense. I, I've, I've come to this point where it, it's very kind of twee, but this notion that there are three criteria for me to select uh, a piece for the for the Sydney Festival. One is that it has to have um, demonstrable skill. There's a skill being demonstrated in the work that you're doing. There has to be uh, a kind of aesthetic judgment being made or, or you know, some form, like it doesn't always have to be beautiful. It can be absolutely ugly as well, but there's an aesthetic judgment that I'm contributing to the world aesthetically. Mm. And that also then there's a story, a meaning, something that brings new narratives to light. Um, or old narratives, I guess, or reimagining old narratives. But the idea of skill, aesthetics, and story, it, it's, it's not hard to do. But when, I, when often people come to me and they'll go, I, I want to do a reimagining of Oedipus Rex. You know, great, why? <laughs> and they go, well, because it's a classic. And I go, yes, but why do you want to do it now? Why is it important to do it now? And I'm not saying that, you know, everything has to have a, a, a whiz-bang reason, but the artist has to have the reason to do it. Mm. They have to know why they think it's important because we are the storytellers of the tribe. We are the, the people as artists. We get time out from hunting, gathering, finding shelter, doing all that stuff. We get time out and our job is to be the best artist we can be to our tribe. And people can define that in any way they can. Yeah. And I feel that in a festival context, I want there to be this contract that we will talk about things, give you vocabulary for change, look beyond the horizon about what's coming up so that tomorrow is not the first time you engage something that you might find uncomfortable. Yeah, a current cushion for those ideas. Yeah. How, if any, do you, do you track that idea between festivals? You know, informally, informally, what, how does the conversation keep going for you between your, those intense periods? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, uh, when I give notes, as a theatre maker, when I give notes um, to people and they say, oh, well, slow down, slow down, I'm missing that. And you go, no, no, no. If it, if it keeps floating up in your, in your, if it rings true to you and you remember it, then you know it's true. Mm. You, you don't have to write it down all the time. That things keep floating up to you. And and I do believe in the unconscious or the subconscious in this way, so that through conversation and trying to stay as open as possible as both a maker, but also in this case, a, a curator programmer, that if you stay open to the conversations, things just keep, keep coming up. Of course, I have my own predilections. The whole indigenous storytelling is important to me, has always been important to me, so I'll go in that direction as well. But interestingly, to look at circus, circus, suddenly yeah. has become important huge to me. Huge Australian import as well, huge, isn't it? Like export, massive, you know, massive, yeah. massive thing. Yeah. That we are noted overseas a lot for our circus traditions, and we have multiple traditions. Mm. You know, when you think about the, the larrikin circus, the kind of uh, storytelling circus, the almost contemporary dance style circus mm. now, um, the, the beautiful kind of open-hearted um, emotional circus, we have all of these kind of things, and it's interesting to watch the different traditions from uh, from uh, North America and also from Europe look to Australia for guidance. Often in that way, we we don't see that in this country because no, it's don't. all around us all the time. Well, again, we don't think of ourselves as elite, or we would never celebrate ourselves in that no. in that way. I suppose my other question is about those second, third, fourth generation conversations as an indigenous theatre maker and, and curator. You know, you said earlier the fact that we're still sort of having the we're here yeah. conversations. How do you balance that there's sadly still a need for that with also going, 
we we are providing a voice and a space for the the incredibly sophisticated and you know five six generations on from where here how, how does that balance happen for you and uh, it, it's difficult what, what i've loved um in the 30 years of being a, a maker is you know so old but this notion of in those 30 years i've also seen allies in different like education um health uh, housing like lots of allies kind of come through and make sure the story is being told in different ways mm. um and it's interesting that that uh, a good example would be or stolen you know uh, which is in fact uh 20 years old this year yeah. 20 years of that particular play and you look back and you go it came at the right time and it actually provided this vocabulary for change or uh it it, it took the the capital p out of politics and gave everyone a kind of emotional language to talk about that particular issue or, or uh, black diggers mm. which was looking at um indigenous servicemen in world war one we have ways of telling these stories that you then realize allies pick them up and it suddenly becomes this huge change the rsl you know indigenous soldiers now marching at the front of anzac day marches or, or even their, their, their children mm. marching at the front as a way of saying, we, we acknowledge our indigenous mates. And you go, wow, that was impossible to imagine 10 years ago mm. or, or 15 years ago. And now it's kind of rolling out in different ways. We don't know how powerful we are as artists sometimes, but if we think of ourselves as the, as the, the tip of the spear, we kind of pierce something, move through something and things follow. Uh, it needs a kind of courageous strength to make sure that those stories are as powerful and as strong as they can be uh, and that you know what your targets are. Mm. And, and for me, I guess, um, you can be disappointed, you can be, as I was saying before, jaded and, and a little bit despondent, or you can see that f since 1967, you know, you get people like me, you know? I was born in 1969 and I, I grew up alongside all those Aboriginal policies along the way in terms of education and health, uh, um, employment opportunities, travel, and you get someone like me because someone took notice and said we need something different mm -hmm. to help people along the way. And I accept that I might be exceptional in the environment. There might be people who are still feeling that they don't have access to those kind of things, and I, I appreciate that. But there's also a point where you go, um, by, by me being in this position now and others like me or Nakia Louie, who's fantastic, getting out there and actually making a huge difference and having uh, their stories told, that it actually creates a, a, a collective ambition to s take a step forward. Mm. And what I worry about is that we socially are stepping forward, but we're politically stepping backwards. And... We need to find ways of getting more politicians to understand those bigger stories. Is there anything else you want to add about the festival this year? Oh, it's pretty. It's pretty lovely, big. Pretty lovely coverage. I think uh, the the biggest thing for me is about issuing the invitation, and then inviting Sydney and and people who visit Sydney to engage in big cultural conversations. And all the Sydneys. All the different yeah, Sydneys. Yeah. And, and if I was to be critical of other festivals there's sometimes a fascination with the external you know it's the the, the cultural cringe manifests yeah. itself in so many different ways yeah. what i love about sydney festival it's actually about the city it yeah. comes from the city and bubbles up and artists we do have big international works and things but it bubbles up from the people who are here and i love that yeah and i think that the quality and caliber of the works that we've mentioned that are in the sydney festival collection you know works written and created by australian makers yeah. at scale with ambition and support is yeah I, I find that funny we'll happily bring a belgian show with 30 schoolgirls out but if you <laughs> if you presented the same idea to an australian company chances are that would not you know wouldn't it wouldn't succeed but there's mm. there's people making room for those sort of yeah you know, and more and more so i think there's more and more yeah. opportunities for that it's fantastic thanks for your time today i really thank appreciate you. it thank you very much thank you